But we're going to start from the beginning and we're going to go through it step by step. And we've got kind of a, a system here as far as uh, for each test, we're going to you know, talk about the procedures and then we'll, we'll watch a video. And then we'll we'll uh, then we'll go into to the to the worksheets for each module. So the, the tests that we're going to be talking about out there today are uh, there's about a half a dozen of them. And pretty much all of them are pretty quick turnarounds as far as uh, running them and getting a, a, an answer. Uh, except for the, the first one here, which is what they call the uh, the moisture density relationship of soils, which we call a proctor. And the reason we have manual hammer on there because that's the that is what we would normally use uh, to do our proctor test. Uh, sometimes in you know in the in the district lab or or a, a testing lab atmosphere, you would probably have a a mechanical hammer. But uh, it, it's more practical, I guess, if you're out on a job and you have to do a proctor. It's it's better better to you know more practical to have a manual hammer. So that's what we're going to have the emphasis on today is is with a manual hammer. Besides the proctor, and I, that's quite involved, but there's also a, a one-point proctor, which is a kind of a abbreviation of, of, of a proctor, full test. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about three different types of moisture, moisture, ways to take moisture of the soil, and that's important out there too. First one here, the, the NDT-265 is the laboratory determination of moisture content of soils. Uh, that's basically the with the oven method, as you would see it in the middle picture there. There's there's a couple of ways also to when we're out on the project to actually determine what the in place density of the soil is any any time during the compaction process. And the first one here is uh, called the density of soil in place by the rubber balloon method. And so I'll continue on here. Uh, the next uh, slide is another way to do the first one here, ND217, is another way to do a, a, a moisture out on the field or anywhere for that matter. It's called a speedy moisture tester. Maybe some of you have run the one uh, before. It's uh, basically, uh, it doesn't really need any electricity or anything like that. It's, it, there's a, a chemical reaction that happens that uh, we'll go over a little bit later here that, uh, so we can actually determine the moisture out there uh, using, using this apparatus. And it's, it's kind of geared for remote areas. And it's a little bit probably the fastest way to get a, a reading. The next one here, the T191 uh, density of in place by the sand cone method. That's just another way to to determine the over to the right, the bottom right here is another way to determine the in place density of the uh, material or the uh, you know that you're actually trying to compact out there at any time during the compaction process. You can actually get an in place density uh, with this apparatus. The last one here being the microwave method of drying soils. It's the third way to do a moisture test out in the field. Uh, and more and more of these are being brought out in the field uh, because you can hook, hook up uh, units to actually get the power out in, you know, with your vehicle to run it or a generator or anything like that. So it's becoming a very practical way to, to do my moistures out in, in a field atmosphere. And so these last two here, the, the microwave density and the in-place soil method, the, these are probably the newest uh, additions to the DOT testing. And uh, that, I imagine they've been around for you know close to 10 years now. And the reason these two were brought on is because we started to do, uh, prior to that time, we, we didn't, we just sort of had ordinary compaction on pipe projects. We decided to go doing, since we were having a lot of pipe issues, center line pipe issues, especially in the uh, in the winter time, we decided to, uh, you know, have a more stringent uh, compaction requirements. And so this came along with that, uh, mainly because the material that we were using to backfill the, the pipe were was a, more of a granular material. And that wasn't very friendly to the water balloon method, which uh, which has a balloon that is easily punctured. So that's why we went uh, with this. And, and along with that, with the um, the microwave method is, is a good way to, besides the oven method, to uh, determine the moisture content of, the, of angular type material like class fives and stuff like that. So those are the tests. From there, I, we're going to go over how to run these tests, but what we really want to do is, is really look at kind of the overall picture as, as to why we're actually running these tests. And then what, you know, we have these moisture tests, we have these in-place density tests, we have a, a proctor test that's done normally before we do any compaction. How do you put all these together? What, what are we trying to achieve here? 
And, and really, one of the big things is, is out there is the primary thing is is compaction. Compaction is there's a lot of benefits to compaction. If you went through some of the asphalt classes too, uh, and or a bit out on an asphalt project, compaction there is very important. And it's really a densifying of uh, of the material that you're working with, which all you know has some very good benefits to it. Uh, for instance, uh, minimizing future settlement, increasing shear strength, increasing or decreasing permeability, uh, increasing the resistance of frost action, and of course uh, slope stability. And you have to kind of picture, um, you know, your soil out there. It's it's very important. It's really the foundation of of what you're building everything else on. And so that has to be as good as it can be. There's all types of different soils out there. And uh, it's very important that it, it's compacted to the, to the specifications. And so what, what influences compaction? And I, I guess uh, one of the, the, probably the two things that stand out more is moisture content of that particular soil you're trying to compact and the energy that, or the work that you're putting into it. And as you can maybe envision a, a project out, you know, you know, a, a dirt, for instance, a, a, a soil project where you're getting soil ready, you probably see a lot of uh, compacting equipment going over it. And the soil itself has got some moisture in it. I, I guess, you know, if you take some, if you take a, just a particular amount of soil and, and it's completely dry, it's very, you probably notice if you've been at the beach and, and you have really dry sand that's not any moisture in it, it's very hard to compact. Uh, if you can picture yourself trying to build a sand castle, for instance, uh, you really can't do it if it's really dry, but, uh, and you can't do it if it's too wet, but if it's, if it's just right, you can do it. So that's what we're going to try to find out here today is, is at what point does the soil get a certain com- uh, moisture content where the contractor can actually efficiently compact it to where it's, it should be. If it's too dry out there, the contractor is going to have a hard time compacting. If it's too wet, it's going to be the same way. There's going to, there's got to be a certain point that they don't have, you know, they can go over it so many times, uh, as many times as they go over it, it's more efficient. It, it compacts better. So, so two things that really com- influence it are moisture content and the energy applied to the soil. So here, for instance, here's a couple of pictures here, just basically some soil. Uh, over to the left, and and there there might be a little bit of moisture in this soil, but you could actually, you know, just looking at it, you wouldn't think that there would be. You think of it as a solid mass, but but really there are quite a few voids in there, and you could almost prove it by you take a cup of water and probably an entire cup or maybe more, and 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 pour it into that soil on the left, and it probably wouldn't go over the rim. It would probably soak into the soil and that mean that's really mean kind of means that there's there's a lot of voids in there and so those voids really are aren't doing us any good uh, if it's soil and we're going to be building on it we want to be able to to compact it to a point where it, the that it'll hold what we're going to put on top of it and so uh, just a little bit of uh, over to the right I just I just had a you know just a little bit of tamping from that uh, tamping rod there would actually densify the soil and that's really what's happening there is that the you're actually doing compaction or densifying the soil density really all density is is weight over volume and so to increase the density either in a case like this and the known volume uh, if you if you just tamp it down you can see that it's going to take up less volume so it's the same amount of soil with less volume so it's actually getting denser as you're going so basically what we're trying to kind of preliminary information, I guess, before we start doing or look going over our first field test today, which is called the moisture density relationship of soils. This is kind of what we're, we're looking at here in the sense that we've got moisture, a range of moistures on the bottom here. And we have the, on the, uh, the side here, we have uh, the dry density of this material. So as you can see, it's, it, and for in, in every case here, we have a, 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 uh, the same amount of energy that's actually going to be applied. Uh, you can almost picture it as, as one rolling effort or rolling efforts out on, on a project or, or just a certain amount of uh, energy. So in every case, the, the soil out there might be very dry. Say it only has eight and eight 
eight or nine percent moisture in there. So basically what's happening is that for the given amount of energy that's put in, it really only will attain about, you know, this dry density of about 118 or round it off. Uh, so, okay, well, let, let's add a little more moisture to it, mix it in. And you can see that, uh, say, in the case of this one here where you got nine and a half percent, you can actually attain a little bit more density there. And what's happening there is that the water is starting to, giving the soil some lubrication so the soil particles can easily move past each other. And when they do that, they move into these air voids. And of course, the soil is going to be heavier than the air voids when it's being densified. And so you're actually getting a denser product. Well, this is, keeps going on and depending on the soil, of course, but it goes on to a certain point where you can reach an optimum. And in this case, uh, where you can actually get the, the greatest amount of density out of the same compactive effort that you've been putting into it, all of these points. <clears throat> and in this case, the, this one here would be just a little bit short of 11% uh, percent for this soil actually gave the greatest uh, density, dry density. Now, there's a certain point though that you, that like everything, a lot of things, uh, there's an optimum to things. So the, the more, now, if, if more moisture is actually added to this uh, soil and compacted once again, then it starts to kind of go back the other way where you start to, uh, now you're getting less densities again. Why is that? Well, one of the reasons is, is that the soil, the water now is becoming a little overwhelming and it's starting to replace the soil particles that were normally in, the, in closing up the air voids. And, and, and basically the, the, the water is, is lighter than the soil. And so you could continues to do that. More water you add, the worse it gets. So th this is what we're really going to try to find out before we go out into the field to do any compaction is we want to know for each type of soil that's out there, what this curve is, what this relationship is to the moisture, the density to the moisture. And this is really quite important because a lot of our specifications, as you'll see later, are going to be uh, referencing this type of test that we're going to do because this is really going to be what we're going to base everything out on when we go out to compact. So by performing, you know, this relationship or what we call a proctor test on a given soil, we can gain a, a, a lot of information before it's even, for even do any compacting in the field. And that's the main purpose of it is that we want to find out everything we can about that soil before we go out to compact it. So we're going to find out what we, you know, a maximum dry density, which is that top of that curve. And we're going to find out at that point, what, what is the moisture content or what we would call the optimal moisture. And then during that process, we're going to be, you know, determining what kind of soil we're dealing with out there too. Are we dealing with granular soil? Are we dealing with a more of a, a clay soil or, or a silty soil, or maybe something, a combination of all of it, which is what they call a loam. And a lot of that can be shown, can be uh, decided just by physical looking at it and feeling the soil, you know, what, what really, what you have out there. So here's some of the equipment that normally would be used for a proctor. The sieves behind there are basically to sieve the soil. Once you go out and get a sample off the road, uh, you want to get it to the right moisture where you can actually sieve it through a, a, a minus four for it so that you can run it. So then you've got your hammers there, a couple of different types of hammers. That's really the energy that's put into it. Uh, you, you, it's, think of it as a, if you've been on a project, that a, a, a bridge project or something where you have piling it. It's basically a, a hammer that comes down and, and goes through a distance or a weight that comes through a distance. So it's actually putting work into the soil. So basically, these definitions will kind of go, will, will kind of work with these all through the, the class. And uh, so optimum moisture definition is a moisture content at which a soil can be compacted to its maximum dry density with a given compactive effort. And the maximum dry density is the dry unit weight defined by the peak of the compaction curve. And basically, that's what we're saying here. So this is the peak. This is the what they call the maximum dry density. And at that particular point, that's your optimum moisture. So those are things that we're going to be using uh, out in the field. So.
Okay, so so uh, Mark, if you want to start, you can here. The North Dakota DOT uh, modified the AASHTO standard to only allow the method A and method D. Uh, the method D should only be used in lieu of the method A when there's more than 5% of weight retained on the number four sieve. But then uh, the method D is used without correction for all soil aggregates that have material passing the three quarters, but corrections must be made for the materials that have 30% or less retained on the three quarter. And that is the North Dakota T224. And that's all we're going to mention basically on the course correction today, just because of the math on it. Uh, next slide, please, Kurt. The two different standards for moisture density relations are presently used by the North Dakota DOT or the A and the B. Uh, the main difference is the energy and compaction applied to the soil. Uh, the pictures down here on the left, you can see that the left side of that first picture is drier material and as you work to the right, it's wetter material. And then just the, the sieves on the and all the equipment on the right. For your North Dakota method A, the T99 the hammer weight is 5.5 pounds, uh, drop distance of 12 inches, three lifts of soil with a four inch mold, passing the number four with 25 blows per lift. Uh, the T180 on the method A is a 10 pound hammer with an 18 inch drop, five lifts of soil, diameter mold is four inch, and the materials passing the number four sieve with 25 blows per lift. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the method D uses both the same hammers and same number of lifts, but the mold changes from a four inch to a six inch, and the soil is passing a three quarter inch sieve with 56 blows per layer. Just sample sizes required for a method A, one point is about seven pounds, method D about 25 pounds, multi-point approximately 35 pounds for method A and 125 for the method D. And then here's that uh, same curve that Kurt showed you before. There's the peak, your maximum dry density at your optimal moisture, about a 10.8 there. Uh, and then I got a few more things here on the procedures. The, the soil is damp when received. It can dry, you can dry it until it's easily crumbled under the trowel or by your hands. And this can be air dried or oven dried at 140 degrees to break the material chunks up so it'll pass through the floor. Disregard any materials retained in the number four or that are organic material and then divide your Sample into five representative samples of seven pounds. Approximately 60 milliliters of water will give you about 2% increase for your moisture. You don't want to exceed over 2.5% per curve. Then you should allow them to cure in a moisture proof container for about 12 hours. Uh, the method D uses approximately 215 milliliters of water to bring it up about 2%. When you Weigh your mold for your tear weight. Uh, the specification says the, the empty mold without the base plate and collar. Uh, a lot of times we use the base plate and collar. As long as you're consistent, that's fine. Uh, it's approximately an inch and three quarters loose lift in your four inch proctor mold for the T99 and approximately one inch on your T180 for your lifts. And then before you start ramming them with the hammer, you want to take and lightly tamp the soil so there's no loose or fluffiness left. You can use a deep fluffing hammer like that one Kurt has shown there next to the proctor mold or that you can use your regular hammer but just light little tamps to fluff it down and then your number of blows is evenly distributed across the weight of the surface of the whole proctor specimen and then remove your soil and slice through the center and it takes approximately 100 grams from one of the cut faces for your moisture. And then you can determine your moisture by the North Dakota T265. Remember to report your de maximum dry density to the nearest one pound and your optimal moisture to the tenth of a percent. Try to make sure you every effort that you don't have your points any farther than two and a half point or percent moisture out. Uh, North Dakota DOT does use allow a one point proctor 
which is basically pounding either T99 or T180 one time and then plotting your dry density and moisture on a family of curves that we have uh, developed for either the T180 or the T99. You got to make sure you use the right curve. It is always recommended to use a multi-point whenever possible, but you can use that one point in a hurry to get a general idea of what it is, or if you want to check to make sure your proctor is still active, you can use that one point. Uh, I'll go ahead and play the videos, Kurt. Hi, I'm Mark Riley with North Dakota DOT, Fargo District. Uh, Josh Erickson and myself are going to show you guys the North Dakota T99 and T180 moisture density relation of soils found in the North Dakota DOT field sampling and testing manual. If yours is not updated, please check the DOT website for the most current versions. Uh, the North Dakota DOT only accepts method A and method D for the two types of proctors. T99, method A. It's a five and a half pound hammer with a 12 inch top. Uh, the method we're actually going to show you today is a T180 method A. So we won't be using this hammer, but I just wanted to show it to you. T180 hammer, 10 pounds, 18 inch drop. Now the method A uses a four inch proctor mold. The method D uses a six inch. Orange proctor mold. We also need a few other tools, a defluffing device that is used to defluff the material after you add it, and a knife. So, a T99 method A is three lifts, 25 blows per lift. The T180, which we're going to demonstrate, is five lifts, 25 blows per lift. And when you get done and want to be approximately a quarter inch higher than the collar, once you're done pounding your proctor. So we've got our material. Got a sample here of some dry minus four material for the method A. And then we have some material that's approximately 60% moisture that we'll be pounding our proctor with. With that, uh, Josh volunteered to show us how to pound proctor. Cut it. Any questions up to this point? Anyone? Okay. I'm going to be demonstrating the T180 proctor method. I'll be doing five lifts of material uh, and hitting each lift 25 blows with this 10 pound hammer that drops 18 inches. So I'm going to take material and for clarification I'm using four inch proctor mold. So I'll put as much material in as I need to to get to where compacted it's going to sit about a fifth of the way up to this line here. I'm going to take this as going to help me defluff the material so that it's even before evenly spread out before I hit it with the hammer. <clears throat> now you take the hammer and you set it in there gently. Now you make sure to raise the hammer all the way to the top of each blow and you let it drop and free fall. Once you do that, pick it up and carefully move the hammer over a little bit inside the mold. You 
because you want to move around, not just hammer in one spot, and you continue. So that's two. I'm going to continue on. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. 21, 22, 23, 24, and 25. Now when you're done, especially with more wet materials, you want to make sure everything's staying in there. So lift the bottom of your hammer, make sure you're not pulling the material out. You want to keep this as consistent and as accurate as possible. If you look inside after, you might see but there are some spots where the hammer went lower and some edges are sitting higher than the rest. You just take your little uh, tool and flatten that out. <coughs> now, now I will put in the second lift. Okay, we're going to go into the third part, Mark, now, or? Are you... okay. Yeah, all right, thank you, Josh. Uh, just for clarification on Josh's third lift, when he missed the full lift on that 11th point or pound, have we, at that point, you probably should have redid the, started over with a new point, just so everything is valid and consistent. But for these, the video we let it go. Okay, so now we're approximately a quarter, maybe three eighths inch higher than the collar here. Take your spatula, go along the edge, just kind of free the material free from the edge. And then I like to do this in the pan, just so I don't have to make a mess to clean up later. So loosen the top of the collar, turn it. Then take your straight edge, and scrape the top flat level. Remove all the material from the mold. this point you can weight the mold and the collar because we started with a tear weight on our mold and collar for the weight of our proctor or point here. Now we're going to extract specimen out of the mold so we can get our moisture. Loosen it up. Pull it up. This is the extraction jack.
Sometimes on these aggregate samples, you can pick them up, tap the sides, and it will come out without breaking. Uh, you should uh, know your material before you try that one. So we'll use the extraction jack here. Lift it up in there. And when you start to make sure you're not catching the side of the mold, so you don't scratch the mold when you extract it out if you need to. Put a little pressure off, readjust so it pumps off. your sample for your moisture. Take your trusty old uh, Remington uh, butcher knife here. Slice off the outer edge of the specimen. And slice off this outer edge of the specimen, giving an inside piece of the specimen. Place that specimen in your tear pan, about three to 500 grams or a little more if you want to wait. Place your wet sample in your oven, try and call consistent weight. It doesn't change by more than 0.1% or overnight by DOT standards. You pull this out of the oven, make sure it cools to the touch. You can touch with your bare hands to record your dry weight. That is, uh, T180 one point proctor, <clears throat> complete a full proctor, you would run three to four more points of different moisture contents to get to establish a curve. Thank you. The video where they're actually doing the, the hammers or, and lift, putting the lifts in the soil out, there were, you notice there was only two there two times, but it actually for that particular hammer, as Mark mentioned, or for that procedure, there's actually five lifts. After the fifth lift, you want it to be just nicely over, as Mark was showing in the film, nicely over the point where, you know, it's just a little over full, so you can easily uh, get it a straight edge to level it out. Uh, if there, if it's less, you really should do another one. If you end up being less than that, you, you really should run the test over. We'll just uh, jump right into the to the worksheets that go along with this test. And basically, the form you're going to be using for this is is called the uh, 163 state form number 163. And you know, once once you've done all your points, as you can kind of see in this photo here, we've done five points from driest to wettest. In this case, for this particular one, uh, we're doing a, a T180 here, and uh, we're going to be using the, the the method A. We did the method A here for this particular one, as, as Mark showed here. Uh, so we've got the the small one over here, of course, is the is the method A, and the large one is the method D. So uh, if when you were to run this one and you found out that you had a lot of material that was passing the over five percent that was passing the number four after you've run it through the four, if you've got over five percent that's retained, then you're going to want to, as Mark mentioned, you're going to want to run one of these. And the material you actually use for this, for this one, is not minus four like this one. It, it, you actually use uh, a minus three quarter when you run this particular one. This being a lot more blows, 56 blows. So depending on what proctor, and in this case, we ran the method A at T180. So we use this large hammer here in the small mold, as was shown in the video. And so we've got four points here that we've done already. And I'm going to go through the fifth point here as we go along here. So we've got information here for four points, but we're going to go through a, a fifth point. We'll do, start that out right now. Uh, in all these cases, the, 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 the row here, which is the volume of the mold for a, uh, a method A, is, is 0 0.0333 cubic feet is what it holds. 
That, that's the volume of it. So that's constant all the way across. The, the weight of the mold plus compacted soil, uh, you're going to be doing five points. It's five points here. So you're going to have, obviously, you're going to have a little bit different number here since the compacted soil is it's going to be a little bit different. So in this case, uh, here's how it how it looks. So, so you've got your mold and, and the compacted soil. That's the weight of this. The weight of your mold is another constant, which in this case is 4.1 pounds. And so, so what we're trying to find out here is, is basically, for this first part, is, is you've got the weight of your mold plus compacted soil. You know your weight, your tear weight of your mold. So if you subtract one from the other, you're going to get the weight of the compacted soil that's actually in there. So basically, when, when Mark extracted that uh, material from that mold, that's basically what that would be, it would be that number right there. Moving on. Uh, next step here is now we kind of highlighting the volume of the mold here. We know the weight of the compacted soil. So this is where our density comes into play, weight over volume. So if we divide this weight of the compacted soil by the volume of the mold, we're going to get what they call a wet density. And the reason it's called wet density is because there's still moisture in it. There's still moisture in this. Next step would be then to um, go down and as you noticed when, when Mark sliced off that material after it was taken out and, and put it in the oven, one that was for a reason, that was to find out how much uh, moisture content of that soil was. So the first step in that basically, once the first thing that Mark would have done there, would he would get a wet weight plus container of that soil. So immediately he would, he would uh, take it and weigh it and this is the number he would get. After he dried it down to a constant weight, take it out and let it cool and dry and, and then weigh that again. And the number would be lower, in this case 129.5. So the difference between those two is really the moisture loss that was in that soil. So that's 15.1 grams. The next step then in the moisture process is to take your the dry weight plus container, the one that we took out of the oven and dried, and subtract that or subtract from it the, the tear weight of the container or the empty container weight, just the empty pie tin in the, in the case where Mark was working with there. By that then you would actually get a dry weight of the soil. So, so now what you have, you've got the dry weight of the soil and you've got a moisture loss and all moisture really is when it comes right down to it, moisture content in every case uh, is basically the, the moisture that you lost on the top versus uh, divided by the, the dry weight of the soil. So this moisture loss would be divided into the dry weight, of the, or excuse me, the other way around. <clears throat> the moisture loss, the dry weight of the soil is divided into the moisture loss to determine the moisture content of the soil, in this case 16.3. So now the reason we did this here, we have to have that is because we have what we call wet density up here from the previous calculations. If we know what the moisture content is, we can determine what the dry density of the soil is. And the dry density is basically, if you can remember back when we, uh, we were talking about earlier about maximum dry density of, this is what we're, we're looking for. We're looking for a dry density. That's the numbers we're going to be, the units we're going to be looking for is dry density. Dry density is, is a constant. Uh, with wet density, you have a variable and that's the water in it. But the dry density is that same, for instance, if you can imagine when we were back when Mark took that, extracted that, or that uh, soil sample from the mold, if you were to, the way it was sitting, or way it was right there, there was moisture in it. If you were to magically take that and put it in, in the oven and let it dry down and it, and it miraculously stayed the same shape, it would be lighter because the water or the moisture would be out of it. And that's what that really is here is dry density of the soil. That's what we're looking for. So in this case, all these across here now are the dry densities for your different moisture contents that you did. And you'll notice that in the wet density, 
Uh, in order to really determine if you've got a good curve going, so to speak, like the ones we saw earlier, is if this wet density, as you can see, it starts to increase as you as you get wet, it gets wetter to a certain point. Then it starts to kind of level off and go back a little bit the other way. Uh, and, and even with the dry density, that's about the point where you could probably say, well, I've got enough information. And, and as you can see that, you can see that more prevalent with dry density here. Uh, you're starting up as it increases, and all of a sudden it starts to drop down. So somewhere in here, in this area, is where your curve is going to be, the, the, what they call the maximum dry density. And so now what we can do is we've got all these moistures down here and all the dry densities up here. Now we can graph it. We can graph that curve. And basically, so you've got what we've done here is we've taken the moisture itself, the moisture ranges, and we we put them down here maybe start a little bit before that and a little bit after it so you've got your moistures down here and you've got your dry densities to the right here and it just increases as the dry density goes up and now what you want to do is you want to plot these points these five points here's situation so in this case here uh, this is that first column 9.7 and about 116 and so on and so forth and after you get these plotted then you can go ahead and draw a curve now the base basically these curves are kind of best fit and but they're also supposed to be fairly you know kind of symmetrical kind of even on each side so this kind of looks like a dot to dot here a little bit so to speak but uh, sometimes you might have this point might be down just a little bit. This one might be up a little bit. You have to try to draw a best fit, you know, bell curve to match it. It, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to fall on every point here exactly. And, and so now this is just by hand. I did this one by hand, but most of the time now you're probably going to be, you know, in this day and age, you're probably going to have a computer program to do it. And we'll probably look, you know, something like this.